Hello, this is another one of my videos on Alistair Parker's short introduction to the Second World War. We've now reached chapter 11, which concerns the subject of morale. Morale can be defined as the willingness to work harder, to accept sacrifices or to take risks to help win the war. It comes mainly from two sources. First, a sense that the war was worth winning, and secondly, a feeling of membership of a community and a desire to have the respect of its other members. Urgent and recognisable danger to a whole society strengthened morale, so long as there was still hope of fending it off. Britain in 1940, Germany in 1944, Parker also says in 1945, but I'm not, not so sure of that. Although different the morale of civilians and non-combatant military and that of the fighting men in active combat influenced each other. The sense of long-term purpose mattered more for civilians and non-combatants, whilst for those who were fighting, short-term survival usually came first. Situations like heavy aerial bombardment of cities made them more alike. Civilians also hoped that the war would bring a better world. Aware that the poorer sections of their populations were more vulnerable to the shortages and constraints of war, governments generally responded by demands for quality of sacrifice during the war, and often reluctantly preached post-war social levelling. In Britain in particular, the managed wartime economy brought full employment and, despite rationing, regulated and subsidised prices seemed preferable to the free-for-all economy of the 1930s depression. The war encouraged collectivist ideals and increased support for the Labour Party, whose ministers seemed outstanding often in their contribution to the direction of the civilian war effort. Of particular note here were Ernest Bevan, the uh, Minister for Labour and National Service, and later the Foreign Secretary under the post-war Labour government, and Herbert Morrison, the wartime Home Secretary, and later the leader of the House of Commons. In Britain, the most successful wartime publication was the government-issued Beveridge Report, Social Insurance and Allied Services, produced by Sir William Beveridge, later Lord. Published in December 1942, it called for an attack on the five giants of want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness, including proposals for a free national health service, reform of the educational system, and full employment fostered by the state, all to be established after the war. It sold 100,000 copies and evoked widespread popular support. Churchill and some of his Conservative colleagues were reticent to support the proposals, but it was enthusiastically embraced by the Labour Party, probably a factor in Churchill and Conservatives' defeat in the 1945 general election. This is Beveridge, an important Liberal politician who was elevated to the peerage in 1945, and who authored not only the Beveridge Report, but also a later study full employment in a free society. Important aspects in morale were cinema, smoking and alcohol. Cinema provided an easy means of entertaining millions of people during the war. Every major belligerent country produced well-disciplined documentaries or historical films with analogies to the present day to inspire the people, as well as tolerating escapist films merely to entertain them. Other forms of self-indulgence were facilitated by government controls of the economy. Thus, British and American cigarette smoking reached new high levels, and even the strict non-smoker, General Montgomery, carried cigarettes in his vehicles in order to hand them out to his troops. British beer production was maintained, but at a lower strength, whilst important imported wines and home-produced spirits became scarce. Generalisations about artistic trends during the period are futile and pretentious, in Parker's words, and much depended on the individuals involved, but the war tended to restrict the market for the arts, 
and by lessening international contacts, retarded artistic production. By controlling scarce resources, continental European governments were able to encourage some painting, music, writing and music, and inhibit others. In Britain, however, a government subsidy was provided to encourage even adventurous and non-commercial work in order to enhance morale. Although the state can coerce men to join the military, those who win battles must voluntarily risk injury or death. This requires a self-controlled courage which can't be compelled. Whilst all armies use conscription and combated desertion by seeking out punish and punishing offenders, countries varied in the nature of their punishment. In the Soviet Union, any soldier caught in the rear areas in unauthorized retreat by the political police was likely to be shot. During the final months of the war, German SS units did the same with their troops, and throughout the war there was a growing resort to capital punishment by the regular military authorities, who executed perhaps 20,000 men overall. I will add, by the way, that both the Soviets and Germans created penal units of men who were commonly assigned dangerous or fatal assignments as a form of punishment. By contrast, although some British commanders asked for the death sentence to be restored for desertion, it wasn't. In the American military, this is not in the book, the death sentence remained as an ultimate threat for desertion, but only 49 men were so sentenced, and in all but one case the sentence was later commuted. Again, I'll note in passing that both Britain and the United States allowed for men to register as conscientious objectors on religious or moral grounds. Germany and the Soviet Union didn't. The primary general reason for bravery and endurance in combat was concern for the good opinions of others. Society expected endurance. In societies which approved of the war, those who served as soldiers, sailors or airmen received popular admiration and cosseting. Civilian morale here powerfully impacted that of the military. The degree of encouragement was proportional to the hazards they were assumed to face with air crew, submariners and parachute groups being amongst those most likely to be admired. Carefully controlled official publicity for military operations also impacted the morale of those engaged in them, as did unit and branch insignia and medals. The most important specific factor in combat morale, however, was for the individual to feel that they were a valued member of a group whether it be a squad, a platoon, a bomber or tank crew, company or whatever, if he felt that the group cared for him, then he was more willing to sacrifice his own interests in order to not to let his comrades down. Comradeship was a rewarding emotion and a formidable weapon in its own right. As long as the group's members, both collectively and individually found their immediate commanders skillful and remoter authority was seen as able to organize effective supply and training for the hazards of war, then their morale was strong enough to withstand anything short of protracted and overwhelming stress. Such stress was real, however. Even the strongest had a breaking point, as shown in World War I and confirmed again in World War II. When this occurred, varied partly with the individual's morale, but more with the nature and intensity of the stress of combat. For example, in the battles for Normandy from July to September 1944, one-fifth of all British casualties in the Second British Army were regarded as psychiatric in nature. Two American psychiatrists from the Army concluded that, first, Almost all men in rifle battalions in the battalion theatre who were not otherwise disabled ultimately became psychiatric casualties and that the average soldier would be worn out by a year of fighting and would lose his efficiency well before that. Secondly, the British infantry troops in Italy coped better psychologically than the Americans because 
They were regularly pulled out of line for rest periods every two weeks or less, whilst American troops were kept in line for up to two months or more at a stretch. Fighting in World War II was no less arduous than in World War I, despite assumptions which are commonly made to the contrary. It was true that a smaller proportion of troops were actively engaged in fighting in World War II than in World War I, because there were far more specialists than support personnel. Thus, for example, in a World War II British Infantry Division, only 4,000 men out of a total of around 17,000 carried a rifle, whilst in the Pacific, each American infantryman required about 18 men to supply him. But for the British and American frontline combat troops in Europe, losses were higher as a percentage than in World War I, and worse still for the Germans and the Soviets. Morale, therefore, was vital. In this, the German and Japanese troops came from cohesive societies, I'm not quite sure how cohesive German society always was, in which members felt a sense of mutual solidarity and obligation. They both possessed a high number of well-trained, intelligent and experienced officers and NCOs. In particular, the German army had many experienced and capable leaders, both officers and NCOs, and they came from a society in which military service, generally and traditionally, had high prestige even in peacetime, and which possessed a powerful sense of national identity. By contrast, British and American soldiers came from societies in which a military career in peacetime was despised, I'm not sure whether that's too strong a term, and in which class or ethnic divisions weakened mutual confidence, nor did they have large peacetime officer corps. The morale of American infantry was further weakened by a careful weeding out of specialists and the intellectually gifted for separate branches of service. The Soviet military, for its part, contained a wide range of peoples of different national origins and of educational attainments. Morale could only be effectively maintained in carefully chosen elite units. In conclusion, the Allies won the war because of their greater numbers and superior access to war material, and not through superiority in morale. So that's a relatively short chapter. Uh, many thanks to you for listening, and particular thanks to my patrons for their kind support and encouragement. Without them, I wouldn't be able to make these videos. You are very welcome to support my channel. Please do like, comment and share on the videos if you will. Subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos. I'll give Patreon and PayPal links below if you want to provide practical support. Next week, uh, we'll move on to a new chapter, Driving Back the Germans. Have a good day.